Freedom is knowing that you are a creation of the creator. A creation of the creator. You have to not be scared to go away. Obviously, I think a lot of people are frightened that if they go away, if they disappear for a while, everything will crumble. They'll come back and there's no place for them. Life is not problematical. We make it problematical because we're all listening to something, to someone else, to some thing, without listening to ourselves. We buy a lot of junk, for instance, that we know damn well we don't need. <laughs> we clutter up our lives with insignificant things that have no value at all. But when we start to think about how simple life is and how simple it should be lived, then we begin to realize, I have no problem. I don't have a real problem. Problem is something you make. Life is something you live. I think the break, actually, being away was good for us all, you know, because uh, it gives you a chance to realize why you're doing what you do and actually want to do what you do, not just do it because you're already there and you're on a roll. It's not easy. I'm not going to say it's, you know, it's all fun and games, but when you love something from the depths of your soul, you truly do enjoy every aspect of that life. And there are more mornings when I'm tired and I don't want to get up and, you know, deal with some of the things you have to deal with in the industry, working all day long. But um, then, just like today, you know, and being with you and doing things that we've done, you know, I, I, had, I had a lot of fun. So when you really do love something from, from, from your heart, uh, you really do enjoy it. And I really love my life. I have good friends, good family. Um, I wake up every day and I work doing something I love. So there's nothing better than that. I truly am happy. I cannot complain at all. That would totally be ungrateful. And you cannot give or make what you don't have. So how do we make world peace when we don't know how to have peace for ourselves? and work really hard on being good at you. Because just like hurt people hurt people, not peaceful people wreak havoc, right? This project is a reflection of the love that we are finding for ourselves. Us being kind to ourselves, us being patient with ourselves and our journeys and wanting to really inspire the people around us to do that same thing. Love can be romantic, love can be political, love can be social, um, love can be spiritual. There's a lot of darkness. And so we know that our role as musicians, as leaders, as people that other people look to, um, the most powerful thing we can do is radiate light. Did you set out to have this multifaceted career that, in which you basically did any, anything and everything? I no, I was scared to death to do anything like getting into show business because I was brought up r rather strictly in the cotton field in South Carolina. And as a result, you do what you are told to do, not what you want to do. And I think that I was afraid always to exercise my feelings about anything because I thought I would be pew, get my face slapped or something like that, or a little slap on my derriere because I wasn't obedient. But when the time came for me to really say, I think I'm in your way to my aunt when she brought me to New York, I think I'm in your way because she was a very beautiful woman and she didn't know anything about taking care of children. My mother had died, or whomever was that was saying that she was my mother, who had given me away to so many people at the time down south. So she brought me up north, my aunt, and she told me she was my mother. So I'm very confused about the whole thing. But at any rate, I thought that I was in the way. And when the time came that I was offered this opportunity to go down and meet Catherine Dunham, because I had seen her in the movies with these beautiful legs in the air, you know, and oh, Oh, and I thought, oh. And she was having these dances, the uh, auditions, and the drums were going, So I joined the class and went, <laughs> And I won a full scholarship, and that's how I got it. <laughs> That's how I got here. <laughs> but I want you to know that I'm going to be 75 years old on January 17th. <laughs> Thank you, 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 thank you. <laughs> so, so where did this confidence come from? <laughs> it's confidence? It's, I think, hunger. I was, <laughs> I, 
I wanted to survive on my own without having anyone be so responsible for me that I have to go to them and ask them for a piece of bread. So I learned in, in instinctively using that animal instincts that I had when I was a child in the South because being given away, you know, you have to rely on whatever is thrown to you in order to survive. So I was following the cats and the dogs and the birds and whatever was thrown from the table. It was a toss up between me and the animals as to who was going to get it. <laughs> so I had to learn how to survive. And I think that's where the, that desire comes from. I never want to be a burden on anyone, not even to my children. Living, because as I said before, my life has been extremely interesting and I wouldn't want to have missed it for the world. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book now that's out called Rejuvenate, It's Never Too Late. Because those of us who have come through the years, we begin to realize, I think all of us do, at a certain stage of our lives, what life has really meant to us and the value of that life. And if we didn't do that, we're absolutely out of our mind. But go for what you really love, not because the money is more important than anything else in the world. Because if you go for what you really love and what you really want to do, you'll do a better job at it. And money will always come and make you comfortable if you love what you do. As we enter into the year of 2022, I thought it was really important to kind of share some of the audio that I had been listening to. If you are somebody who would prefer to listen to an audio book in a certain area of your life that you would like to focus in, you guys can always try my long-term favorite, Audible. Audible has created a destination for complete well-being that delivers inspiration, encouragement, and actionable steps no matter what your goals are and what phase you are in your life. You guys can go to www.audible.com slash wellbeing and the Audible editors have curated a range of titles from different ranges of self-care and self-development categories. And one of my favorite books that I actually mentioned in one of my New Year videos in 2018 which is The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins is actually on the list. I personally like to think of these two months into the year of 2022 as a year of detox and setting yourself up for the actual energetic new year in spring, in the spring equinox. If you have not tried out Audible, you guys can get your free audiobook within the first 30 days, plus access to the Plus catalog by going to www.audible.com slash wellbeing or text wellbeing to 500-500. But I don't think that we can push people to awareness. I think people come to awareness via experience. Um, of, of the world that they live in. Pima Children says, start where you are. Freedom is knowing that you are a creation of the creator. A creation of the creator. Why is that so profound? I don't know. Freedom is knowing you are a creation of the creator. I think freedom is also choosing, like, can it be too far? Can I yeah. follow? So if, if freedom is, being a creation of the creator, I think freedom is also choosing to to stand in that, you know, stand in that power, knowing what that is. And what is the miseducation we give them? And part of the miseducation we give them is that you can violate someone and then say you love them, which doesn't mean to say that we, we're, I'm not saying in the, the discipline is important because discipline is crucial to any true love. Um, with that we have boundaries, that we set boundaries. Um, so that I, I think part of what's happened to us as a nation is we have confused discipline with a kind of blind obedience to authoritarianism, whether it's children to parents or us to a government or a nation that is acting in a way that is, is, is autocratic and, and wrong. So that the book doesn't just try to look at our personal relationship to love, but what's happening to us as a nation as we move away from the kind of ethic of love that many of us felt undergirded all the great social movements, um, movements for social justice in our society. So he wanted me to talk to him about how do, how do men in our culture move into a space where they can have that healthy masculinity that, that is not the patriarchal dominating masculinity, but one that allows them to claim the space of their own hearts and the, their own need for love. And, 
one of the ma major studies I think that feminism has brought forth is our emotional neglect of adolescent males. You know, the idea that somehow when a boy starts turning 12 or 13, we suddenly decide he doesn't need affection anymore. If he wants to be aloof and not speak, and I think that many men have, have, have been falsely led into thinking that love is not vital and important to them. I talk about the fact that one of the wonderful aspects of love is giving, and that as we give to others, we grow in our capacity to connect. I mean, what would it mean for us as a nation to start off feeling that love is important for males? as much as it is for females. Because deeply embedded in our national psyche is an assumption that love can't be important to men. How will men go and fight wars if they are dedicated to love? And until we begin to, to recognize that love has to be essential to men if we're going to end sexism, if men are going to reclaim the spaces where they can be connected to their feelings, to their fathers, to their mothers in different kinds of ways. But partially the book says romantic love has been the myth that has, as, as the only love that really matters. It challenges that notion. That's one of the new visions that it says all the foundation of all our love, like the foundation of a house, there are certain principles that will make you have a sturdy house. And those principles are the same irrespective of the kind of house you're building. The same is true of love. And we have been a culture that has overvalorized romantic love, that no matter how horrible and miserable your life has been as a kid or as a teenager, someday you're going to find this love, and it's going to come into your life, and it's going to change all of that. And many of us found that that was not so. And I think a lot of men felt that one day they'll grow up and they'll be humanized by a woman or a partner giving them love, rather than thinking about what will it mean what will it take for me to become a loving person? I particularly take his definition of love as the will to nurture one's own and another's spiritual growth and link it to Eric Fromm saying, love is a combination of care, knowledge, responsibility, commitment, and trust. Because one of the things that's happened in our culture is we equate love primarily with care. Uh, that we cannot be loving and tell lies. That people want to know how we can live deeper and more meaningful lives. Uh, a line that says, this book is testimony, a celebration of the joy women find when we restore the search for love to its rightful, heroic place at the center of our lives. Tell me about that. We've always thought of our heroes as having to do with death and war. And you know, when we think of Joseph Campbell and the whole idea of the heroic journey, it's rarely a journey that's about love. It's about, you know, deeds that have to do with conquering, domination, what have you. And so part of what I wanted to say to people is that living as we do in a culture of domination, to truly choose to love is heroic. To work at love, to really let yourself, you know, understand the art of loving. I think we have to connect that to an absence of free speech because when you live in a country that makes truth something that is associated with the painful that should not be spoken, it becomes hard to get people to value speaking freely. Because, there, you know, there are things that we have to say that will be wounding. Like, for example, in, in, in my latest book that I'm talking to you about, about black people and self-esteem, there are things that I have to say about black children and how they're parented. Um, that are that would sound harsh to a lot of people, but those things have to be said if we're going to address in any way what is happening overall collectively with black children and self-esteem. But what I find is people are really hungry for truth, and and that hunger, as I said in my book, Yearning, I think is something that unites us across class, race, sexual preference, and practice, religion, and I and I see the hope, the hope that I feel within my own self and with other people is, is that hunger for truth and for ways to live our lives more fully in a manner that's more fulfilling. And it's that hunger that keeps a place for the dissenting voice, that keeps the place for speaking freely. Because that is both an endangered space 
and a space, on the other hand, where we have more people than ever before who are hungering to hear that dissenting voice. Um, and I, I think that that's the paradox. I don't have a family. I'm an orphan, so I know nothing about my blood relations. I only know what I was told, that I am one of the children of the cotton plantation owner's sons who took advantage of, obviously, my mother and therefore put me in a position of not being accepted by anybody. And this was a, a plantation in South Carolina? Yes. But I don't remember that exactly what their name was because I never talked to anybody. I never wanted to be seen. But I do remember as I was a child picking cotton in the picking cotton along with the rest of the field workers, that these, this particular one boy of that family who used to come and pick up the bales of cotton or the big sheets of cotton at the end of the day, he was the one that was always throwing me food, nuts, or whatever was prevalent at the moment. Throwing you food? Throwing me. He was throwing me food, yes, nuts and fruits and things. And you always throw food at an animal. You don't throw, throw food at a person. Well, well we were treated throwing? like animals. What else were you treated like when I was a kid in the South? We were not treated like people. We were treated like what the, what it did say. We we're supposed to be, if you have one drop of white blood in you, you're still considered, what, an animal. We were not considered, what was it? You Three-quarters of, three quarters of a, yes. every human being. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like they said, the American Indians. There was nobody here. Ha, 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 ha. And they called them savages. And they destroyed them. They didn't, thank God, they didn't destroy all of them. But it's amazing how a group of people will come into an area of the world, destroy the culture, destroy the isms of the people, and 200 years later they go back and dig it up to find out how intelligent those people were. I never did understand that kind of thinking. But that's what, that's what, what you call civilization does kill off one uh, um, culture to put in theirs and then they realize what they've done killing the intelligence of another person or another group of people and then they dig it up I see so much of that on television these days because I don't read as much as I used to even though I was an avid reader at one time my eyes are not that great anymore so I get tired easily reading but I watch History Channel it's amazing what has been shown now. The history of the other worlds that we are now finding how intelligent they were. So the next five years, what I really had to do was get back to the very basics. I had to learn how to be healthy. And what that looked like for me is I had to figure out what does health look like for me physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and socially and make those things my number one priority, which is code for I had to make me my priority. That's a wild thing to do when you're so used to doing everything external, to serving, to loving, to trying to push everything around the world to be peaceful. But when you're avoiding yourself, that's not possible. So I developed a wellness routine. And for me, that looked like all those things I thought my therapist was gonna tell me, just sleep, drink water, exercise, take time for yourself, go to therapy. It's important, it will save your life. And honestly, that was the basics for me. And then on top of that, I had to figure out, okay, what are the things that I need to nourish myself? I had all of these still questions around how do we make change in the world? How do we go through and make meaning out of our lives when there's so much pulling at us? How do you rest? And what I would say that I'm most proud of through all of it is that through every moment I was present, I was healthy, I was myself, and I can confidently say that I thrived throughout all of what was challenging and wonderful at the same time. That is called wellness. It's being able to manage the internal and the external in a way that creates a harmony for yourself to where you know you are still grounded in who you are you're at peace with all of what is in you and around you and figuring out, okay, what are my next best steps? Purpose has two options. You can set a goal, you can meet that goal, but then you're bored and you have to figure out new goals. It's like this endless cycle, right, of chasing external things. 
Or you can set a goal for yourself that is so far out that it's actually unattainable and peace and fulfillment's always just beyond your reach. So you consume and you grasp and you take in so much all the time looking for, how do I make this better? And the truth is, I don't think it's through purpose. I think really what we're looking for when you see protests and you see people fighting causes or going to work, you're looking for fulfillment, we're looking for peace inside, and we're looking for how do we act well and be well with one another. And you cannot give or make what you don't have, so how do we make world peace when we don't know how to have peace for ourselves? So if you want to save the world, if you want to live in an environment that is thriving and where prosperity looks the same for all of us, not just the few who have the most privilege, you start with you. You start with figuring out what does health look like for me, physically, mentally, socially, emotionally, spiritually, and work really hard on being good at you. Because just like hurt people hurt people, not peaceful people wreak havoc, right? So my challenge to you today is to really take serious this commitment to cultivating wellness for yourself. Because once you are filled yourself with that kind of peace, it has no choice but to flow out into all of the spaces around you. And I can guarantee you, you will enjoy your life so much more, which is truly the reason we're here.